Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, setting up your first Azure portal. My name is Akila, and I'm an Associate Product Marketing Manager here at ShoreWeb, and I'll be your host for today. Before we dive in, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to the recording after the webinar. Second, we will be having a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to submit your questions through chat or the Q&A window so that we can address them during that time. And lastly, at the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. We'd appreciate if you could take a moment to please complete that so we can hear your feedback and comments. So on to today's session, uh, we have Jason Lambert, who will be presenting. Jason is ShareWeb's advocate for Azure solutions. He is a cloud infrastructure veteran with over 10 years of experience assisting MSPs in enhancing their Azure skill sets and building IaaS solutions for their clients. So for today's webinar, we will cover how to start with setting up your first portal, securing your portal with MFA or multi-factor authentication, and a quick introduction to virtual machines, storage, and backups. And now I'll hand it over to Jason. Thank you, Akula. Um, thank you for everybody that has joined. Before we get into the presentation, I want to just talk about some of the things that SureWeb can do for you as you are moving forward in developing an Azure business. Uh, we're here to help you with your solution design. If you have any questions, concerns, um, or customer opportunities, when we get off this call, if, if anything comes to mind, please reach out to your SureWeb account manager or inside sales representative and ask for the Azure team. Our Azure team will help you end to end be able to uh, figure out what the opportunity is for your customer and how to put it together in Microsoft Azure. We also do partner enablement. So this is part of our partner enablement program, having webinars and training to help you and your team obtain Azure opportunities as well as hopefully over time, uh, turn you know random opportunities into building an Azure practice. And then optimization. If you are at a position where you've got some customers that you've onboarded and maybe they're challenged around their invoicing, feeling like uh, they're spending more than they should be spending in Microsoft Azure, there could be uh, optimization issues that our team can help you out with. Uh, not only would our Azure team be able to get involved into that, but we also have a pro services team, which our pro services team can help from a deployment optimization uh, perspective. So if you have any questions or need any help around Microsoft Azure, again, please reach out to your account manager or inside sales rep. Let them know you'd like to speak with the Azure team and we can certainly, they'll, they'll make sure to get you connected. So our Azure team consists of a couple of people right now on the front end. So people that are partner facing, we have teams that are not necessarily partner facing that help do uh, deployments and management of Azure infrastructure. Uh, Ron Ferrar right now is our business development manager around Azure opportunities. And then our pre-sales technical team is Christian and Neil. And those, the three of, of them are able to help you walk through and configure any opportunity that you may need uh, assistance on when talking with your customer. I'm just clicking a button here and I keep, I'm flipping too far. Um, so we're, I'm gonna actually just break into, uh, oh, I'm getting away from the presentation and I'm going to actually dive right into the Azure portal. I think that the best way to actually show you um, what we're talking about today, or you know, explain to you what we're talking about is actually to show you. Akila, are you able to see my screen okay? Yeah, you can see it. All right, perfect. So my assumption here is that you've already talked to our Azure team. If you're interested in getting a subscription set up for your customer, Again, please reach out to your account manager. I know I'm being a little um, redundant saying that, but I just wanna make sure that you go through the right process. Reach out to your account manager, let them know you have a customer that's interested in moving to Microsoft Azure and you need to get a subscription set up and our team will help you walk through and set up uh, your customer 
perhaps if it's our first time customer, set the customer up in our portal and then be able to deploy an Azure subscription uh, for your customer needs. Uh, if you've already got a portal set up, then we can just help you set up the Azure subscription. When you log in, uh, you would need owner or global admin privileges uh, when you want to get set up or once you get set up with an Azure subscription. If I click down here by the, the gold key, this will actually show you, this is my demo Azure subscription here at SureWeb. And I do have some uh, infrastructure set up right now. I'm not building a ton, but uh, I've got a couple of things going on. And so you have the ability to go to IAM if you wish, and that would give you an idea of what your level of access would be. Um, right here, I can you can see I'm I'm the owner of my subscription and I'm the administrator of the subscription. I can add addi additional. Uh, I'll get rid of that here. I can add additional roles, administrators, custom roles right through here if I wish to the subscription, or I can just pop down to uh, Entra ID and I can add users. Uh, I can do. Um, uh, identity access management through there, or I can do role-based role access control through um, Entra ID. So when you get uh, into your account, you can uh, see here, um, there's a dashboard. Uh, it would be right here. And you at the dashboard, you're able to pin services that you're deploying. So I've got a bunch of services down the side here, I can go ahead and pin those services to my dashboard. I can make another dashboard. It's just a quick and easy way for you to have services that are set up and be able to access them, especially if you do it uh, randomly or daily and or need to see uh, certain uh, bits of information, be it cost management or uh, you know reserved instances, whatever those may be, you, you can easily pin it to your dashboard here. Uh, another way to get to services when you get set up in Microsoft Azure is just actually to type it in here. So I want to talk a little bit about MFA when I got set up uh, and opened my subscription before the presentation. I just typed in MFA and as you can see here, uh, the search tool will bring up services within your subscription that have MFA or marketplace um, also there may be services within the marketplace that offer mfa solutions for your customer or for you to deploy for your customer rather uh, and you're you're able just to click it here if you need to learn more about it i put in mfa and i can see documentation from microsoft as well as entra id services that are available here mfa is really important and I do, although it's not necessarily part of, you know, getting started with your Azure subscription uh, from an Azure perspective, MFA is very important from a tenant perspective. So if you have a customer today set up with 365 and they have not yet been set up with Azure, MFA is still something that I would highly encourage you to set up. Microsoft in July started a process of enforcing of MFA around their customer tenants. So that would be your customer tenant. And the reason being is hackers, if you don't have the security set up properly, hackers are able to get into subscriptions and then they start running jobs and costing, um, they, they run up bills. Uh, I, true story, uh, it wasn't here at SureWeb, it was one of my previous roles. I did work with a customer he set up, uh, sorry, it was a partner rather, set up a subscription for his customer. I think it was either a Thursday or a Friday. Um, wasn't really ready to get into doing any deployment. So he just got the subscription set up and left it for a couple of days, came back to start doing work on the Monday. And over the course of the weekend, somebody had, had logged in or hacked their way into his account and racked up a bill, a bill of $13,000. At the time, we were able to reach out to Microsoft and Microsoft was able to identify that it was a hacker and gave us a credit back and we were able to give a credit back to the partner and the customer uh, to offset the charge. But Microsoft has basically said over the last number of months, 
there is enough in Azure security today to deploy best practices and to stop people from utilizing services. So they're basically saying, when you get your subscription, make sure you set up correctly and enable, well, your tenant rather, make sure that you enable MFA on your tenant to stop you know, shady people from getting in and uh, using your services and creating additional charges. Um, I believe Microsoft said they're not going to be doing credits, uh, but I don't want to get too far down that rat hole because I could open up a whole different conversation. I just want to make sure right now that if you have a subscription, rather a tenant for your customer, please make sure today you enable MFA. I'm going to flip over to this new tab. If you're not sure how to get started with it, you could just go to https colon whackwhack aka dot ms slash entra capital e i d m f a wizard and that will take you to the microsoft 365 admin center and in the admin center uh, right here it will walk you through the wizard of getting mfa set up on your tenant so it would be set up in 365 as well as azure just by following a few steps you would want to make sure that the person that is setting this up, as it states here, has a Microsoft Entra ID premium license. So the administrator would want to have one premium license to be able to go ahead and set up MFA. And then you can set up MFA for free for the rest of the users in the organization. I believe it's up to, I don't know, 50,000 users. Uh, if you want additional MFA features, so I think the initial one starts with um, oh, using the Microsoft Authenticator app. If you want SMS or phone calls or other features like that, I believe that's part of the P1, uh, Entra ID P1 license, and you would have to um, enable that or to you know, purchase and deploy to get that set up. So enough with Entra ID. I'm going to go back over to my demo here. And I just want to see real quick, make sure I'm on track. Uh, yes. OK, so we're going to um, look at, I think it would be good to actually take a look at cloud management and billing. If you slash your customer uh, decided to set up a subscription uh, a lot of times they would like to see what their consumption is and it's very easy to go into the service and start looking at uh, consumption fees by going through the cost management tool so i was able to you know jump in take a look at through a cost analysis how much the customer is spending i believe i went you know through the overview i was kind of talking not sharing the steps um, through the overview, come on, Microsoft. Uh, I clicked analyze cost. And then I clicked on all resources. And that gave me a list of resources and the spend. Although I'm in the US right now, SureWeb's a Canadian company and we have a Canadian uh, account, but the principle would be the same. If it was on the US side, you would see resources in US dollars. Um, so it's easy to jump in and get an idea of your consumption. It's also easy to change the scope and get an idea of what your um, where to go, what your bill could look like. So basically, it'll give you um, a forecast of what a, uh, additional spend could look like uh, as your customers go month to month. I'm not finding the exact button to push here. Access control. That's not right. Uh, monitoring. You can also set up cost alerts. So if your customer says, hey, I want to get alerted if you know maybe I spend $1,000 in a month or if I'm on track to spend $1,000 a month, and I can set up alert rules. Uh, to ensure that I'm getting alerted uh, for the services that are happening, or if there's a system that actually goes down, I want to get alerted. 
that there's going to be an outage or if the system went out uh, so I can jump back in and get it uh, set up again. Is it budgeting here? No, I don't have any budget set up, but I could set up some budgets. I could also use uh, advisor recommendations. So I can go through here. I don't have anything in my subscription today uh, of any value for it to populate the screen, but you could also look at uh, advisor recommendations for what Microsoft, based on uh, their dashboard, provides as services uh, for you to make things more efficient, more effective, utilize uh, better utilization or optimization. All right, so I'm going to go back to the dashboard here. Um, we, we're going to talk about virtual machines and storage and uh, backup, etc. So you need to set up a virtual network to get Azure to run correctly, just like you would on premises. I'm going to try and do this in the same fashion uh, to give you a kind of analogy of what you do today as to what you may do in Azure moving forward. So on premises, you would have to set up your network uh, if you wanted to communicate with all your servers and storage. In the same fashion, you would you know, either set up virtual networks through this button here, or if you were to add a virtual machine, uh, say we wanted to get going and set up a Windows Server 2019 data center, or if I want to set up a Windows 11 professional machine, uh, to be used, I can click on any one of these buttons, or also I can set up Linux machines. I believe there's 55 or 60 percent of all Azure machines running today is actually a Linux machine. Satya has made Linux very much available within the Azure data center, um, so they're not bothered if you use Linux or Windows. It's fine either way. So I can go ahead and click on this. I can say create. If I say create on the virtual machine, it, I still get the option to create uh, whatever operating system I want. So I can set set up here, I'm gonna use my sub. I can either use an existing resource group or I can create a new resource group. Uh, let me refresh that. Seem to stop here. So I've got a bunch of resource groups that I've already set up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, oh, here, actually your one-on-one demo, I can use that. I can create a virtual machine name. So I would consider, um, so I'm on-prem and I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole too far either, but on-prem, uh, your customer may buy a server and then through virtualization, you may set up different virtual machines within the server to better maximize its, uh, the opportunity to use the consumption of, of what's available to you from a CPU, RAM, and storage perspective. Um, in Azure, I would not consider this virtual machine the same as the physical machine that you have on-prem. I would rather uh, suggest to you that this virtual machine would be similar to the virtual machine that runs a specific workload in Microsoft Azure. So um, that would be more effective. So you may want to call this virtual machine, let's say application uh, QuickBooks, right? Maybe QuickBooks is something that your customer runs. I can't put it in, I need to keep no space. Oh, we'll just put it together. Uh, I, I can decide anywhere around the world where I want to get this machine set up. So if I'm in the US West or the East, South Central, I've got uh, Central US, I've got data centers everywhere. I just another caveat that I wanna uh, drop for you is if your customer has different locations around the world and you're interested to deliver services to them, you can, as long as the invoicing comes back, the billing come, comes back to the US. So if the customer has a location in the United States and they take care of all the billing, you can deploy services anywhere you want around the world. If by chance they do not have a billing entity in the US, then let's say for example, Canada, because it's close and we've already talked a little bit about it. 
if you wanted to service a customer whose billing entity is in Canada, you would need your organization to set up a presence in Canada as well. So as long as you have a presence in the country where the billing comes from or where Azure is being billed to, uh, you can service the customer there. And then if it was in Canada, you have a presence in Canada and they have offices around the world, including the United States, you can set up services for them uh, as, as needed. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use US East. Um, I can decide whether I wanna use availability zones or not. Um, so I'm not gonna use any availability zones. An availability zone is, so let me back up. So Microsoft has regions around the world as I, and I talked about them in, right here, uh, these regions. Within each region, is a minimum of three availability zones, which are technically three data centers. And I would say, suggest to you that the data center is about the size of a super Walmart. Um, so if you want multiple availability zones for redundancy, then you could go ahead and select it. But for the sake of setting this up, I'm just gonna uh, zip through it. Um, so I've got easy, uh, I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna use availability zone one. Oh, actually, it's going to take it off. So none required. I'm going to use a Windows Server 2022 Data Center Edition. Again, I could also use older Data Center Editions. Anything older than 2016 is not supported in Microsoft Azure. Let me be clear. I didn't say it won't run in Microsoft Azure, but it's not supported in Microsoft Azure. So if you have issues with it, you'd be on your own to uh, support yourself if you use something older than Server 2016. There's also Windows, uh, as you see here, uh, Windows 10 Pro, Windows 11 Pro, and then there's certainly different Linux versions. I'm just gonna go ahead and pick, uh, we'll pick Data Center 2022. Um, and then here is where I pick the size of the virtual machine that I like to use. So I can pick, I can go to all sizes and I can see like every size within. So basically, if you look over here, you're, these are all different virtual machine families that Microsoft has available for consumption. The top one was the most consumed. I would say general purpose machines are in the D series, burstable machines. So if you're looking for burstable CPU, that would be in the B series. If you're looking for uh, GPU enabled uh, machines, you'd be looking in the N series. They're uh, NVIDIA based machines. They're all available to you if you search for uh, Azure uh, VM families, you could find uh, the document pages on them and they'll, they'll tell you what each family is best to do. Some of them are memory intensive, some of them are CPU intensive, some of them are GPU intensive uh, applications. If you're confused and you need help, again, please reach out to your camp account manager and just say, hi, Mr. Account Manager, I need to talk to the Azure team, trying to get a virtual machine set up and I'm just not sure which one to go with with my workload, and we'd be more than happy to help you. So I'm just gonna bubble back to the top here. I'm gonna pick um, just a small machine. I'll pick this D2 SV3, I'm gonna select it. Uh, that's gonna populate here. I can put in whatever I want for administrator, but please don't put in admin or administrator. Microsoft has those blocked out. And then I can put in uh, my passwords, they like long passwords. I just take a password and actually duplicate it just for the demo. All right, my passwords are the same. Then you can set up your port rules. You're able to use port rules from within Azure and open ports as you need. Um, they, Microsoft would encourage you, like right now I've got 3389 on, 
Microsoft would encourage you to get to access another port for RDP or enable Bastion as your Bastion, which I believe is the service that is managing virtual uh, desktops, et cetera. And it will actually help you um, support accessing machine uh, remotely. Um, and then licensing, if you have hy Azure hybrid benefits, or is it, it's, um, oh, what is it called again? There's mobile licensing, there's Azure hybrid benefits where you can save money by bringing your own license or software assurance is the other one I was thinking of. Uh, software assurance, if that was acquired by the customer, then software assurance provides mobility rights on the license. So then you could take that same license that the customer is using on-prem and move it into Azure. If by chance you don't have that, then, and the customer wants to use their existing license, they can't. Um, they would have to get another license within Microsoft Azure. And that's part of setting this up here now. Um, net, then when, so I'm moving on to disks. I have, you know, I can encrypt my host. I can set up uh, the OS disk size. So by default, uh, the virtual machine will come with right here. It's saying image default 127 gig. This would be the C drive. If I want, I can decide if I want premium SSD, which would be the fastest SSD that they have, standard, or I could use um, hard, just traditional HDD hard disk. So for here, I'm just gonna go ahead and use standard for, um, and then I can decide if I wanna use the platform key management system. Um, that would be having Microsoft manage the keys within your Azure environment, or you could keep the keys to yourself. Mike, if you do use the Microsoft Key Vault system, uh, Microsoft cannot see the keys within the Key Vault that is encrypted. You, you own the key to the Key Vault. Uh, no one else can access it. And then if you were to choose to add an, an, a new disk, um, let's say you wanted, you're setting up a, a file server. I said QuickBooks, but yeah, let's say it's QuickBooks and within there's the, da the database and you want to set the database up in on a D drive or an E drive, That's this is where you would set that up uh, to make it part of the deployment. If by chance you forget to set that up, you can attach, set up the virtual machine or sorry, attach um, a disk, create a disk and attach a disk uh, from the, uh, the disk service uh, in Azure as well. Um, so I'm gonna go to networking. Networking here is where you can go ahead and set up your network. Um, being that this is a net new machine, I could use, so Microsoft's suggesting that I use application uh, QuickBooks VNet because that's what I call the machine. I wouldn't wanna do that. I think I would just create it because it'd be the first um, VNet for the customer, I might just make it a main VNet. So I would say, I could say main here uh, for VNet. And then I can set up my addressing and my subnet according to my needs. I'm just gonna leave, uh, oh, cancel, I'll say okay. Um, so that's there, I can set up my subnet. I can get a public IP if I wish to do so. I'm gonna say none for this because I'm just, it's, I just wanna walk you through the process of getting this set up. Your inbound port is 3389. Um, you can delete the NIC when the VM is uh, being deleted. So if I, if I, so this, this actually talks to you um, tags, which I'm gonna get to a little bit down the way. I would strongly encourage you to set up tags uh, when you set up your infrastructure in Azure. You may only have one machine that you're setting up today, but over time, if you're, you know, the customer's gonna grow, you'll set up more um, and storage and perhaps virtual uh, networks uh, there and perhaps backup. You could set up all those services without a tag. Uh, the challenge will be that if down the road, two or three years, you've got to say, 
the customer decided to get away from QuickBooks and decided to use another accounting system and you wanted to delete QuickBooks and all associated resources with QuickBooks without tags, you may not know what storage was connected when you go into the storage, um, uh, the storage group and that could wind up being challenging, challenging for you. So I would strongly encourage you to use tags as much as possible so that you keep the resources aligned. You can always search by a tag and see what resources, storage, backup, network is connected uh, based on how you set up your tags. So I'm gonna to go to management. Do I want uh, identity management? Microsoft Entry ID I'd probably want, so I would tick that off. If I wanna enable auto shutdown, enable backup, I could do that right here. I could set up site recovery right here. I can also set it up later on after I've set up the virtual machine. I could decide later on, maybe tomorrow or a couple of weeks from now, that now I need to set up backup uh, or DR, and I can do that through the backup or the DR um, resource within the subscription. Um, I can do pack, patch or, uh, orchestration, uh, reboot settings if required. I can go to monitoring, decide, you know, if I want to use alerts, I probably would. Uh, what, can, what, can, how do I want to configure my alerts based on CPU consumption, memory, IOPS, networking? You know, I can, I could do all that here, or I could do it later. Um, and then health, if I want to manage the health. If I get to advanced, I got different extensions. If I want to install VM applications, if I wish to install. Um, I just, I'm moving a little bit quicker for the sake of time here. Uh, capacity reservations, if you're interested in using um, uh, reserved instances, uh, you'd be able to do that here. I've got actually the next presentation, I think it's the last week of um, August, if you go look at on, on the events page on our website, you'll see uh, the pricing one. What what cost model do I want to use uh, when I'm for my customer uh, as I move forward? We're going to talk about uh, pay as you go uh, savings plan and reserved instances. So I'm not going to get into the reserved instances conversation here. I'm just letting you know that you can do it. So you can do it now, or you can do it later. I would strongly encourage you to do it a little bit later and my reasoning for that would be I want to make sure that this virtual machine is up and running and I want to make sure it's being well utilized and it's optimized so a machine that's running 80 percent optimized on Azure is much more effective than a machine that's running 20 or 30 percent optimized depending on the workload uh, and depending on my need I mean if I got a really little machine and I'm just doing you know domain and ADDC on it and the machine's really small um, and it's only just doing authentications, et cetera, it may only ever get to 30% uh, op, uh, can, um, utilization. And But for that machine, that's where I'm at. So using best practices or your professional experience also helps. But then once you get the machine optimized and maybe you have to um, scale up a machine. So if let's say this machine that I picked um, doesn't have enough resources. I could say in the Azure portal, and I should be able to show you, um, this machine's running, um, but I'd actually like, like to bump up the size of the machine because I need more CPU or I need more RAM. Uh, and so what had happened is the system will go on a reboot and when it actually shuts off, when it comes back on, it would pick up the bigger machine. Also, the billing would change from whatever the billing was on the initial machine to the bigger machine. And alternatively, you could step down. So if you've got a machine that maybe it's at 95% capacity and you need more capacity because more people are using it, you need to, or less people, sorry, um, you could bump it down uh, to a smaller machine. I think you get my point um, there. Um, okay, so tags, I already talked about tags. I'm not gonna go over it again, but I, I strongly encourage it so that you understand what resources are attached to what tag. And then finally, I can go to review and create. So as I go through the process of reviewing and creating the virtual machine, you see here Microsoft's giving me a warning that this port should not be left open because it's a, um, 
open for hacks and, and bad actors, uh, but it's gone and validated that everything I selected is real and true and can be deployed. And then I can go ahead and say, create. And I'm gonna go and create this virtual machine um, through the demo here. As I'm waiting for that, I can go into, um, where are we here? Storage, storage accounts. I think I said storage groups or something, uh, but they're really storage accounts. As you can see here in the naming convention, I have already created in my demo account, one, two, three, four storage accounts. I've got different storage within the account, but I have no idea what these storage accounts are because I don't know what this naming feature uh, relates to as it, you know, we talk about uh, what's available there. So if I had have set it up correctly and uh, put tags on it, then I could have tagged um, the QuickBooks. I could have called it uh, app, app, maybe app, QB, and then I'd know everything that was set up under ABB QB. Uh, if I decide to delete the machine, I can del delete the associated storage. Microsoft leaves that available because let's say you have, let's say you have a virtual machine with QuickBooks on it, maybe it's an old version and you've got attached storage and you've got your data on there and you say, okay, I'm gonna get rid of this old machine and my old, and I'm making this up on the fly, so it may not be practical, but it's just for um, illustration purposes. So I'm gonna delete the machine, I'm gonna delete the C drive, uh, and I don't, I'm not worried about the application because I'm gonna set up this new machine and it's gonna have QuickBooks 2024 on it. Um, I could go ahead and do that, and then I could attach this uh, now, um, rogue storage, because I didn't delete it, but I did unattach it from the old machine, I could then attach it to the new machine and import the database into the new version of QuickBooks and continue moving forward. So I didn't necessarily have to get rid of my old version, I just had to, you know, that storage could still be available. So what the challenge could be in your customer where they feel like they're starting to spend more than they budgeted for maybe that over time you know as uh, you're as you are their IT arm you may have done a lot of managing around their infrastructure but not realized that maybe you deleted some virtual machines but the storage is still alive and active although not being used and it's still being built so the customer is paying for storage that technically they don't need but we didn't know to delete it because it wasn't tagged to anything so I'm going to get off my soapbox because I don't think uh, I need to continue going down uh, on the tagging. I think I made my point. Also, it was, it's very important when you create your storage to name it something so you know how to go back uh, and do it again. But I can I can go here. I'm going to create this for fun. I'm going to set up uh, my Azure sub. Um, I'm going to use the same resource group. Everything, uh, if you're not familiar, I don't think I talked about resource groups. You can set up resource groups. You can you set up one resource group for everything in your customer if they're a small, medium business. Um, you may also look at setting up resource groups for larger businesses. Let's say you've got you know um, a small, medium business or a medium-sized business with 100 users in it, and they've got different departments. And maybe you want to segregate and have the accounting set up in one resource group and you know your salespeople, office clerk people set up another resource group and production set up in a different resource group. All that can be done uh, uh, as well. And you can connect your resource groups or uh, you know, connect your, um, your networking to be able to access that information, but it just helps manage the infrastructure better. There's a lot of best practices that we can go over, but this is more an entry one-on-one um presentation today so i want to keep it relatively light but here is where i can set up my storage name so i'm just going to say at uh, quickbooks uh, did i do that right yeah must be oh quickbooks one that worked nope what did i do field contain only lowercase oh uh, quick books or maybe i could just 
QB. What do we got for time? We're getting there. Um, and then I want to keep it in the same region. And then I'm going to use standard uh, storage. I could set up redundancy. So this, we could get into this in more detail. I think there's another presentation that I did around Azure 101 where I got more into, um, so basically locally redundant storage is storage that is on three uh, uh, availability zones. So basically, well, actually it could be on, it's not availability zones, it's uh, fault tolerant um, uh, infrastructure. So I'm using three different storage arrays separate uh, on my data. It's not for backup, it's for redundancy. And I would suggest to you that it's more for protecting you against Microsoft. If Microsoft has decided to take one storage array offline for maintenance, you would still have two copies of your data still available, uh, up and ready, and Azure would then write to a third to make sure that, again, you had three. Ge uh, geo redundant storage is setting storage up against two different regions. So if you have US East and you want to set it up against US West um, for DR strategies, uh, you could do that. Um, there's zone redundant storage. So that would be against three different data centers with uh, or availability center, uh, availability zones within the same region. Uh, so there's many different ways for you to manage your storage. I would just pick uh, LRS storage off the top, just to keep it simple for the demo. Uh, and for any, I mean, any customers just using, they just basically want to set up a virtual machine with some storage on it. Uh, it could be file share, could be database share. Uh, you can go ahead and set that up. And I'm going to review and create. So this is my storage account. Create it. And then I can go ahead, oh, well, it's not ready yet. So I've got two things that are running uh, here. Uh, go to resource. So this is the server that I created. I'm glad it uh, finished before we finished. Um, it shouldn't really take that long. Uh, usually virtual, I think this one was about 10 minutes. Usually they're uh, a bit quicker than that. I, I've seen literally virtual machines take probably three to five minutes and sometimes it'll take 10 minutes. To, I think it just depends on how busy the data center is. Uh, but as you can see here, I'm running uh, the data center edition. Um, I've got the resource. I can go ahead and connect to it through, where is it here? Uh, connect right here. Uh, I can connect via, um, you know, my native RDP application. This will actually download the RDP file, give you the IP address and allow you to connect it. Um, I don't think I did a external IP on this, so you probably wouldn't be able to connect to it externally. Uh, or as I said earlier, if I go back here, uh, go to resource. I can connect it through uh, Bastion. So it's a, a remote um, virtual machine. So I could, that that Bastion service uh, is a service to protect remote access uh, to your machine. And then you can go ahead, you know, through RDP, based on the username and password, I can log in. I log into it. It feels exactly the same way as uh, a virtual machine would. So if you had set this machine up, in your customer's environment as a physical machine and put an operating system on it and then decided to remote to it from your office, um, you know, to start setting up applications and whatnot. Uh, it, it's the same, exactly the same feel uh, here as it was there. I can go down here, uh, I can set up storage, I can set up backup, uh, where's, I can set up disks, so I've got the one disk. I can click on disk again. I'm a little bit all over the place, but if I want to add additional uh, storage for this machine, I can do it here, and then it'll ask me where what um, 
storage, where is it here? Storage account I want to put it in. Um, and then I have the ability to do backup. So if I want to, I could set up a demo vault that you know, basically suggesting a name based on what I picked. Oh, actually, I have one available because I set up a demo vault actually before. Um, or I could select existing. I could create new for this. Uh, by default, it's going to give me a crazy name, but I could say app QB. Um, I can pick the resource group. So I would like to, I would pick the same resource group that I put the server in and the storage in. So it's all together. I can do multiple backups in a day. Uh, on Azure Backup, you can do up to 99 years uh, of storage. So if you've got um, lawyers, medical, where they need to keep it seven years or more, Microsoft can uh, certainly support that. You can do once a day backup, up to five days oper operational tier retention. You can choose backup policy if you've created a backup policy. This is one that was preset by default. Um, this policy will back up uh, every four hours, instant rest restore, retention of daily backup points. Um, I've got this QuickBooks uh, OS disk that I created in the storage group, um, storage account rather. I could use that. Uh, and then I can just go ahead and say enable backup and that'll It'll validate for me and it'll start doing the backup right away. Backup is in Azure is good for file folder based backup. If you need to go back and collect data from, so if a customer said to you, I need a file off the server from three weeks, three months ago, you, you need a specific PDF, Azure Backup is good. ASR, Azure Site Recovery, does more image-based backup. So if your customer needed uh, site recovery as well as file and folder-based backup, um, I, you would deploy both Azure Backup and Azure Site Recovery. Um, Azure Backup will also do virtual machines within the Azure infrastructure. As you see here, I'm backing up the machine I created. Uh, it'll do on-premise machines. Uh, that's kind of the first part uh, of this when I was talking about um, Azure Backup and Site Recovery covering to a specific time or a specific folder or a specific file. Um, if you want to do, um, there's Azure Backup Server that's available. Uh, if you have databases on-prem, Exchange, uh, Active Directory, Domain Controller, uh, different services like that. Our Azure team will certainly help point you to the right service for the right need for the right customer. Um, in backup, if you decided, let's say, um, and I'm, I'm going to say this and then I'll, I'll stop for questions. If you um, had a large amount of data, if it was, say, 20 or 30 terabytes of data, uh, you could either do it over the internet. If you didn't want to manage your um, bandwidth or take up the bandwidth, you could actually do it on physical disk. You could back up to physical disk and ship it to Microsoft, and then Microsoft would upload it and then send it back to you. Or you could get um, a box. So there is, and we could talk about this at another time, where you can actually order a box where you plug it into your network back up all your data and then ship it out to Microsoft and Microsoft would then recover it into um, their data center under your tenant subscription uh, to get the data out there. So with that, I think we've got about nine minutes left. We wanted to stop uh, for some Q&A. So I'd like to open up Aquila if you'd like to um, see if there's any questions out there. Thanks a lot, Jason. Uh, we'll now open the floor for any questions that you guys might have. Uh, feel free to submit them through the chat or the Q&A window uh, so that Jason can help answer them. I did put a message in the chat, so uh, hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, feel free to just respond there with any questions that you have. Yeah, if you have any questions, comments, anything comes up now or comes up later, if you want to reach out, I'm certainly here to help. Um, 
we at SureWeb are super excited to help you, our valued partner, uh, earn your fair share of Azure business around your customer. Um, there's a five or six webinars that we've done in this series. We're going to continue doing more uh, as we get into the fall. If you have specific topics, maybe there's, you know, you'd like to like for us to cover Azure Bastion. I talked about it here. Um, we could do a webinar on that. Just, you know, shoot us a note. Let us know what you're looking for. We'd love to get your ideas. We want to we wanna bring content to you uh, that you want to hear. Uh, very important to us. Yep, and just a reminder as well, uh, if you don't want to reach out to the account, account manager, we do have a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, feel free to drop in any suggestions, any topics you want to see, um, and we will hopefully get that out to you. If by chance you're on this presentation and you're like, you know, GUI's good, but I'd rather use PowerShell, you can just go ahead and click it here, and then it would come up down below. Uh, and you can start using shells. So if you like command line, it's all available for you. Whoops. Right there. No questions, any questions? No questions as of yet. Um, but again, if you do have any questions after the webinar, please feel free to reach out to your account manager or sales representative and we can get you in touch with other people on our end. So, Akila, I, I know we're not, uh, so there were, really wasn't a PowerPoint for this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I suspect we'll probably push the video onto YouTube. Do you have any idea of the time frame that might be uh -huh. for the attendees? Nope, but you will get an email call at this webinar with the link as well. So just keep a lookout for that. If there are no questions, uh, we will conclude today's webinar. Um, again, just a reminder, there is a short survey that will pop up for you after the webinar concludes. We'd appreciate if you could just take a few moments, few moments of your time to complete it and provide your feedback on this webinar and what you would like to see going forward. Um, thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you. Have a great day.